Are you having a hard time figuring out what to get Dad for Father's Day? Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row1 and save 15% off your order when you check out Row 1 Brand's Vintage Sports Victorium Gallery. They have America's best sports art. With over 7,200 historic sports prints, you're assured to find something unique for Dad this Father's Day. If he's an NFL buff, check out the 1963 Vintage NFL Helmet Poster. Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row1. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. Hey, hello, and how are you? Welcome to this latest edition of the Historically Speaking Sports Podcast, where we discuss some of the best moments, best names, and best memories in sports history. I'm Dana Augusta, your host, and I hope you're having a good day, good evening, or a good night, wherever you're, or whenever you're listening to this podcast. And we're back again for another show, highlighting the best in sports history, and I surely do appreciate you taking time to give us a listen. And as a reminder, please subscribe to this podcast if you like what you hear here and check out our Twitter page at HistoricallySP2 for your daily dose of sports history. Now, on today's episode, we will live two marathon postseason games of pro football history that for the most part have almost been forgotten among most sports fans. In our main event segment, we will relive the longest game in NFL history that took place 50 years ago. On Christmas Day 1971, the Miami Dolphins and the Kansas City Chiefs played a marathon divisional playoff game, and it featured a little-known Chiefs running back that had the game of his life. That was our main event. And later on in the show, we will go back nine years earlier to the 1962 AFL championship game between the Dallas Texans and the Houston Oilers, a sudden-death overtime game that is most remembered for an almost ill-fated coin flip. And that is our shout-out segment for this episode. And of course, we will have our top five historic events over the past week. So pump up the volume and you're listening to the Historically Speaking Sports Podcast, which is a proud member of the Sports History Network. The Pigskin Tales Podcast is all about the lesser-known pro football players. Yes, there are stories about the ones we know, like Brad Tarkenton and... Harold Red Grange. But have you ever heard of Ernie Nevers? How about Dave Osborne or even Grady Alderman? These men created their own path to the NFL. How did they do it? Listen to the Pigskin Tales podcast. Now streaming on your favorite music platform. Go to pigskintales.com. Hello and welcome back to the program. I'm Dana Augusta, your host. And you are locked into the Historically Speaking Sports Podcast, where we relive the best that the history of sports could offer. For today's main event, we're going to revisit Christmas of 1971. It is not too often that the world of sports and Christmas Day would intersect. For a number of years, the NBA will rule the roost when it came to sports on Christmas. Several more key matchups will be presented on Christmas Day, so sports fans will have something to watch as you are opening gifts or getting that second helping of that Christmas ham. However, in 1971, the NFL decided to hold a pair of divisional round games on Christmas Day, which that year fell on a Saturday. Now, a lot of people in the media thought that would be a terrible idea. However, the NFL went along with the idea of a Christmas doubleheader on national television. Earlier that afternoon, CBS... On CBS, the Dallas Cowboys traveled to a cold and snowy Bloomington, Minnesota and faced the Minnesota Vikings. Behind Roger Starbuck and running back Dwayne Thomas, the Cowboys punched their ticket to their second consecutive NFC Championship game appearance, beating the Vikings 20-12. They would play the winner of the San Francisco-Washington Division playoff game that would be played the next day. 
Now, the second game of that Christmas doubleheader took place on NBC as the Miami Dolphins in the playoffs just for the second time in their history would take on the Kansas City Chiefs, who had won the Super Bowl just two years earlier. The Chiefs and Dolphins entered the game with identical 10-3-1 records, but the Chiefs were favored. It was a bittersweet moment for the Chiefs, however. This game would mark the last time that would be the last game played at Kansas City Municipal Stadium. They would be moving to a brand new state-of-the-art stadium christened Arrowhead Stadium the next season. Also, despite winning three American Football League championships, this also marked the first time the Chiefs would ever host a playoff game. Kansas City had won the Super Bowl just two years earlier and were led by Hall of Fame quarterback Lynn Dawson and All-Pro receiver Otis Taylor. However, the strength of that Chiefs team was their defense, led by the likes of Bobby Bell, Willie Lanier, Emmett Thomas, and Buck Buchanan, all of them enshrined in Canton. However, the most notable players for the homestanding Chiefs in this game would be kicker Jan Stenerud and a little-known running back from Iowa State named Ed Podolak. The Dolphins were still trying to shed the label of expansion team despite making the playoffs the year before before losing to the Raiders in the division around the season before in coach Don Shula's first season in Miami. Now the Dolphins were a young team led by Bob Greasy and running backs Larry Zonka and Jim Kick. Adding to the mix was a couple of veterans on the offense with postseason pedigree. Wide receiver Paul Warfield and tight end Mark Fleming were players that starred in the NFL with traditional powers Cleveland and Green Bay respectively. Yet the game would come down to their kicker, Gary Uprimian, who was a native of Cyprus and made designer ties in the offseason. As the game began, the Chiefs looked to start off quickly, and they did. Stenerud kicked an early field goal to give the Chiefs an early 3-0 lead. Yet the Dolphins' defense looked to neutralize deep threat Otis Taylor. But with Taylor ineffective, quarterback Lynn Dawson found Ed Podolak for a couple of completions. The drive ended when Dawson found the former Iowa State quarterback on the screen pass for the game's first touchdown and a 10-0 first quarter lead. Moving into the second quarter, the Dolphins began to move the ball, but instead of using their bruising running game, the Dolphins went to the air. Bob Greasy, who was nursing an injured left shoulder, found Paul Warfield, which set up, Larry Zonka, which set up a Larry Zonka touchdown that cut into the Kansas City lead. After the Chiefs' turnover late in the first half, the Dolphins would tie the score on a short Gary Premium field goal going into halftime. In the third quarter, Otis Taylor finally got going. On a, key play of, on a key play of Kansas City's first drive of the second half, Dawson found Taylor, but before he was tackled, Taylor lateraled the ball to Portalac, which gained an additional 25 yards. The drive was capped off by a Jim Otis one-yard touchdown plunge to give the Chiefs, again, a 17-10 lead. The Dolphins would respond on the next drive by uncharacteristically moving the ball through the air once again. Greasy would finish with 263 yards passing on 20 completions on 35 attempts. The game would be tied once again with a Jim Kick one-yard touchdown run, not in the game at 17. Early in the fourth quarter, with the Dolphins driving, looking to take the lead, Greasy would throw a costly interception to Kansas City linebacker Jim Lynch, ending a potential go-ahead scoring opportunity. On the next drive, the Chiefs would go ahead thanks to a key long pass from Lynn Dawson to wide receiver Elmo Wright, which placed the ball at the Dolphin 3. On the next play, Portalak would score his second touchdown, giving the Chiefs the lead once again, 24-17. The Dolphins, relying on the pass, drove downfield once again on the arms and legs of Greasy. With a minute and 26 to play, Greasy would find tight end Mar Fleming in the back of the end zone to tie the game at 24. Both teams had been gearing up for sudden death overtime, but on the ensuing kickoff, Ed Portalak had other ideas. Portalak would surprise the Dolphins and return the kickoff to the Dolphin 25-yard line to set up a cheap shot, a cheap, a chip shot field goal by perhaps the best kicker in the NFL, Jan Stenerud. However, it was not to be at the Chiefs kicker, the only pure kicker in Canton, Ohio, pushed his kick wide right, forcing a sudden death overtime period where the first team to score wins. That sudden death overtime period came became two sudden death overtime periods as both kickers had chances to win the game, but each came up short. As the first overtime came and went, 
The second overtime was much of the same as both defenses rose to the occasion and prevented their season from ending. Each offense needed a big play and the Dolphins offense delivered from a play that they hadn't used all game. The play sprint sweep right trap left sent Larry Zonka escorted by offensive lineman Larry Little 29 yards down the field deep in the Chiefs territory, giving your premium one last shot to win it. After 82 minutes and 40 seconds, your premium connected on a 37-yard field goal to end the longest game in NFL history, giving the Dolphins a 27-24 win, their very first postseason win ever. The Dolphins would go on to shut out the Colts in the AFC Championship game the next week, 21-0, and advance to Super Bowl VI, where they would ultimately, ultimately lose to the Dallas Cowboys 24-3 in New Orleans. That was our main event for this week. And coming up next is our, of course, weekly top five. Stay tuned. We're back here at the Historically Speaking Sports Podcast. I'm Dana Guster, and we are a proud member of the Sports History Network. And before you know, we get on with the rest of the show, just a reminder to please check out newspapers.com. Now, if you're listening to this pod- podcast, you're probably a serious sports fan like myself. And if you're into sports history like I am, you need to check out newspapers.com. That's where I get a lot of my research from. At newspapers.com, you get access to over 640 million pages worth of news from the United States, Canada, England, Scotland, and all over the place, dating back from the 1700s. You can get a free one-week subscription to newspapers.com by visiting sportshistorynetwork.com slash newspapers. And with a paid subscription, you'll also be helping to support the production of this and other Sports History Network shows. That's sportshistory.com slash newspapers. Also, check out our Twitter feed at historicallysp2 for your daily dose of sports history. Also, you could drop us a line or two at our email address, which is historically.speaking.sports at gmail.com. And finally, don't forget to hit that subscribe button wherever you hear this podcast so you can get new episodes every week. Now, this part of the show is our top five. Usually, we talk about the top five moments in sports history from the week that was. Now, this week, we have, we in sports history, there was a premiere of a new sport that sprung up in Springfield, Massachusetts. Also, there was a monumental upset in the history of college basketball and one of the most famous plays in NFL history that changed the course of an entire franchise. So here we go. Number five, a plane crashes into Baltimore Memorial Stadium. On December the 19th, 1976, the Steelers had just beaten the Colts 40-14 in Baltimore and advanced to the AFC Championship game in Oakland. However, just 10 minutes after the game ended, a plane piloted by a former charter pilot named Donald Croner crashed his Piper Cherokee single-engine plane into the upper deck of Baltimore Memorial Stadium. No one was hurt, but Croner was arrested and served three months of a two-year sentence for malicious destruction of property and violation of aviation ordinances. Number 4. The Eagles defeat the Cardinals in the the NFL Championship. On December 19, 1948, the Philadelphia Eagles were looking to avenge their championship game loss to the Chicago Cardinals in the NFL Championship. The year before, the Cardinals defeated the Eagles, winning the 1947 title game. This year, the game would be played in Philadelphia's Shy Park. However, the game would be remembered as one of the snowiest games in NFL history. Known as the Philly Blizzard, the Eagles and Cardinals would play in a defensive struggle where it seemed the snow was the real winners of the game. Yet, Eagles running back Steve Van Buren would be the Philadelphia hero for generations as his touchdown in the fourth quarter gave the Eagles a 7-0 win and the team's first NFL title. Number 3. Chaminade defeats Virginia. On December 23, 1982, 
a little-known NAIA school located in Honolulu with about 900 students, pulled off one of the biggest upsets in college basketball history. Playing in a holiday basketball tournament that would eventually become the annual Maui Invitational, Chaminade University Silver Swords took on the number one team in the country, the University of Virginia and three-time National Player of the Year, Senator Ralph Sampson. With only 3,300 people in attendance, that night would be a very shocking one indeed. The game began at 7.40 Hawaiian time and the Silver Swords controlled the tempo with and with and after the first half, the Silver Swords and Cavaliers were tied at 43. Yet in the second half, Virginia gained the advantage, leading by seven with a little over 11 minutes to play. Yet Chaminade went on a 7-0 seven, seven run to tie the game at 56. The Silver Swords would outpace the Cavaliers 21-16 in the final 10 minutes to pull off the upset of upsets. No one had known about it at the time because the game had ended right around 3 o'clock in the morning Eastern Time and Sports Center didn't hear that Virginia had lost, but they had no idea to who because they had never heard of Chaminade. Number 2. James Naismith Invents Basketball Now on December the 20th, 1891 was the very first game of basketball played at a YMCA in Springfield, Massachusetts. The game consisted of nine players on the side and with 13 basic rules, which actually still governs the game to this very day. On this snowy day, a UMCA, YMCA instructor named James Naismith needed a sport to give his physical education students something to do while confined indoors due to inclement weather. The result is a game that, that more than for half for more than a century is widely held as one of the most popular sports in the world. And the number one event that took place this past week, the Pittsburgh Steelers defeat the Oakland Raiders with the Immaculate Reception. On December the 23rd, 1972, two days before Christmas, the Oakland Raiders traveled to the Steel City to take on the Pittsburgh Steelers and the Steelers' first ever playoff game. In a tough defensive struggle, the Steelers held a precarious 6 to nothing lead late in the fourth quarter. The Raiders quarterback, Ken Stabler, had, who had replaced an injured Daryl LaMonica, scrambled 30 yards, the longest play of the day for the Raiders, for a touchdown. And after a George Blander extra point, the Raiders had a slim 7-6 lead with less than a minute and 17, min with less than a minute and 17 to play. All had seemed lost for the Steelers, especially with 22 seconds remaining and Pittsburgh facing a 4th and 10 from their own 40. In desperation, the Steelers called a play called 66 Circle Option. The Steelers quarterback Terry Bradshaw, under great pressure from Raiders lineman Tony Klein and Horace Jones, threw the ball to the Raiders 35 yard line to, toward halfback John Frenchy Fuqua. Raiders safety Jack Tatum collided with Fuqua and the ball at, just as the ball had arrived. Tatum's hit had knocked Fuqua to the ground and sent the ball sailing backwards several yards end over end. Steelers fullback Franco Harris, after initially blocking on the play, had run downfield just in case Bradshaw needed another eligible receiver. He scooped up the ball just before it hit the poly turf, and Harris ran past Raiders linebacker Gerald, Gerald Irons, while linebacker Phil Villapiano, who had been covering Harris, was knocked down but was blocked by Steelers tight end John McMakin. Harris used a stiff arm to ward off Raiders defensive back Jimmy Warren and went in for a touchdown. The touchdown gave the Steelers a miraculous 13-7 lead and, then, and after Roy Jarella added the ensuing extra point to give the, the Steelers their very first postseason win and forever changing the fortunes of that franchise in the Steel City. And that was this week's top five, this episode's top five. And to wrap up the show, we're going to talk about a late December football game in 1962. Another playoff game that went to double overtime. In fact, it was the first one. And this one has somewhat been overlooked in history, but very important nonetheless. And is remembered for an ill-fated coin toss. Details after this timeout.
All right, and we're back, sports fans. And um, with our final segment of the show, this is what we call our shout outs. And this episode shout out is going to go to a sudden overtime, sudden death overtime game that took place on December the 23rd, 1962, at Houston's Jefferson Stadium between the Dallas Texans and two time defending AFL champion Houston Oilers. Now, this is the American Football League. This is their third championship game, and both teams entered the title game with identical 11-3 and records, even though Houston was a three-and-a-half-point favorite to beat the Texans. Dallas was led by head coach Hank Stram and offensive stars running back Abner Haynes, quarterback Lynn Dawson, and rookie fullback Curtis McClinton. On the other side of the ball was the Oilers and head coach Frank Pop Ivey along with veteran quarterback George Blanda, with backs Billy Cannon and Charlie Tolar, and receivers Charlie Hennigan and Willard Duvall. The game was broadcast on ABC with Kurt Gowdy and Paul Crispin in the booth, and Jack Buck, father of Fox Sports announcer Joe Buck, as a sideline reporter. Now, the Texans would gain an early 3-0 lead as Tommy Brooker kicked a 16-yard field goal to open the scoring. In the second quarter, Texans extended their lead when Dawson found Haynes on a 28-yard touchdown reception, making the score 10-0. Right before the half, the Texans defensive back Dave Grayson intercepted a George Blanda pass, and Hayes would later score his second touchdown, making the score 17-0 at, at halftime. It seemed like the Texans would easily cruise to their first ever league championship. But in the second half, as the winds and rain picked up in Houston, so did the Oilers offense. Blanda would give, and del- would give and deliver the Oilers their first score of the game on a 15-yard pass to Duvall, making the score 17-7. In the fourth quarter, Oilers cut, in, cut further into the Texans' lead as George Blanda knocked then a 31-yard field goal to make the score 17 to 10. Yet late in the fourth quarter, the Oilers were tied to score when Tolar would rumble from the one from one yard out to get to tie the game at 17. Now, as both teams headed into the overtime and, and coin toss, Texans coach Hank Stram instructed Hayes that he wanted the wind, which was gusting at close to 40 miles per hour, at his back if they happened to win the coin toss. He felt having the win was much more important than having the ball. As as ABC's Jack Buck standing at the 50-yard line with a microphone reporting on the coin flip, the Texans would win the toss. After the officials gave the options to Hayes, he responded, quote, We'll kick to the clock. When he said, we'll kick, the Texans had made their choice to kick off, and and the Oilers now had the choice of which end zone to defend. Houston would begin overtime with the wind and the and the wind at their back and the ball. Now, a moment that football fans around the country got a chance to both see and hear it for the first time. As it turned out, it really didn't matter. The first overtime went scoreless, but Bill but Bill Hall intercepted a George Blanda pass to end to end the first overtime with the Texas and an Oilers still tied at four. At, 17. In the second overtime, Jack Spikes picked up 10 yards on a pass and then 19 yards on a run. And after the Texans ran a couple of plays to position the ball right in front of the goalpost, rookie Tommy Brooker, who earlier hit a field goal, came in on fourth and nine and kicked his second field goal, this time a 25-yard field goal to seal the game and the Texans' first AFL championship. And after two minutes and 54 seconds in the sixth quarter or 17 minutes and 54 seconds of sudden death overtime, the Texans had won the AFL championship 20 to 17. A couple of months after the win, the Texans announced that they would be leaving Dallas to a new home in Missouri and changed their name to the Kansas City Chiefs, which would go on to win two more American Football League titles as well as Super Bowl IV and to end the decade of the 1960s. And so that does it for this show. Thank you guys for listening. And don't forget to subscribe wherever you listen to this podcast. And also, please feel free to drop us a line here at historically.speaking.sports at gmail.com or on our Twitter page, which is historically sp2. So until next time, guys, thank you for listening and so long.
We here at the Sports History Network proudly partner with 26 podcasts, all revolving around the history of sports. But did you know that many of our hosts were sports history authors way before they started their shows? It's true. We've got Joe Ziemba, host of When Football Was Football. Joe Zagurski, host of Pro Football in the 1970s. Mark Morthier, host of Yesterday Sports. Tommy Phillips, host of Lombardi Memories. And Scott Adamson, co-host of From the 55-Yard Line. All these authors have many books for you to choose from. To check them out, go to our website at sportshistorynetwork.com slash sportshistorybooks. Pick up your copy today! Soundtrack provided by Kevin McLeod of filmmusic.io.